On this Wednesday night, kids and COVID-19 vaccines. Now that the U.S. has approved vaccines for 5 to 11-year-olds, what can Canadian parents expect? And how can they prepare? Sit down with your pediatrician or your family physician and ask questions. Indigenous stewardship front and centre at the Climate Summit. And the growing pushback against carbon offsets. Plus, IT trouble, a cyber attack cripples Newfoundland and Labrador's health network, impacting thousands of patients. And raising the flag, the sensitive debate over when the time is right. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Some good news for millions of parents waiting to get their kids vaccinated against COVID-19. Now that the American Centers for Disease Control has approved the Pfizer vaccine for children aged 5 to 11 years, it's likely just a matter of time before Health Canada follows suit. The first doses are being administered in American children this week. So what's the timeline for Canada? That's what Jamie Marocker is looking into in our top story tonight. Montreal mom Stephanie Ventura has been patiently waiting for Health Canada to approve Pfizer's pediatric COVID-19 vaccine. I just want to make sure that it's given out and rolled out properly so that the kids that are high priority uh, get it. Including her seven-year-old son, Daniel, who has epilepsy and is living with autism. If he were to catch COVID, it would be more detrimental to his health than to actually get uh, the COVID vaccine and to protect them. You are the bravest. In the U.S., kids under 12 are already getting their first shots. But here, there's some confusion on when Canadians can expect the same. Ottawa won't even say when the shots are set to be delivered. The issue really here is that in the U.S., the process for approval is extremely open and transparent. Whereas in Canada, the process is very tight-lipped. We don't have a lot of this transparency, um, which ends up causing a lot of chaos and confusion because people are just not sure. They just want answers. Some regions have been preparing for November rollouts. But to add to the uncertainty, Tuesday, Health Canada tweeted the review process alone could take months. It later deleted that message and replaced it with one saying weeks. The longer you wait, the, you know, a couple of weeks that you wait, there, there are more kids that are going to get COVID during that time. In schools, ages 5 to 11 make up the largest unvaccinated cohort still gathering. One in five new COVID cases in Canada are now kids under 12. They're bearing the brunt of a lot of these infections. And even though most of these infections will turn out uh, to be fairly benign, uh, there are implications. University of Ottawa professor Amir Adaran, a dual U.S. Canadian citizen, plans to take his kids south of the border to get their shot. And what Canadians are looking at here is if they're lucky, a one dose Christmas for their children, more likely a zero dose Christmas, while American children will have two doses and be fully protected. More confusion on an issue most parents just want clarity on. Jamie Marocker, Global News, Toronto. Ontario and Quebec say they will not require health care workers to be vaccinated against COVID-19. In Quebec, after pushing back the deadline several times, the health minister now says there will be no vaccine mandate for health care workers because it would cause major staffing problems. 8,000 frontline health care workers remain unvaccinated in Quebec. They will have to take COVID-19 tests three times a week and any new hires will have to be fully vaccinated. In Ontario, it's been decided the province-wide mandate is not needed, in part because most health care workers are already vaccinated. And the health minister says she wants to avoid having to cancel surgeries the way B.C. did after its vaccine mandate. In British Columbia, for example, they've had uh, to cancel some of their scheduled surgeries. The concern that we had that we would lose some of our uh, precious health human resources compared to a relatively small number of outbreaks. And that's why the determination was made. Ontario is also expanding the rollout of COVID-19 booster shots. Starting Saturday, roughly 2.75 million more Ontarians will be eligible for a booster dose. That includes people aged 70 and older, health care workers, Indigenous adults, as well as anyone who got two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. They will receive either Pfizer or Moderna. It must be at least six months since your second dose. The province plans to expand eligibility to more age groups early next year. Manitoba is now recommending all Indigenous adults in that province, as well as everyone aged 70 and up, get a booster shot. 
And now we do worry that there could be waning as we're in the fourth wave. We do have an ample supply of vaccine and we want to protect older adults. Air Canada says more than 800 employees have been suspended for not being fully vaccinated. The airline says most of its 27,000 staff members did comply with the federal vaccine mandate. Those who did not are now on unpaid leave. Now to the UN climate conference in Glasgow and a big promise to shift trillions of dollars in private capital towards financing projects focused on decarbonization. Former Bank of Canada Governor Mark Carney, now the UN Climate Envoy, has convinced an alliance of more than 450 of the world's biggest banks, pension funds and asset managers to help finance the transition of the global economy to clean energy. Together, they represent over $160 trillion in assets. Carney calls it a watershed moment in the fight against climate change. The money is here. But that money needs net zero aligned projects. Um, and there's a way to turn this into a very, very powerful virtuous circle. And that's, that's the challenge. It's a shift, but it doesn't mean investment in fossil fuels is ending. Crystal Gamansing is at the COP26 meeting in Glasgow. Crystal. Donna, it is going to take an astronomical amount of money to deal with global warming. Getting private money through world financial systems quickly and effectively isn't going to be easy. But people here say there's no alternative. Whether from Ecuador, Chile or Canada, Indigenous people here at COP26 say they are united in the ways their communities are being devastated by climate change and they want the world to know. All these Indigenous people who have come here for the same reason, their lands are going, their people are sick, they have no food. Groups like Indigenous Climate Action based in Edmonton say if governments and businesses partnered with them, they could help achieve the goals of COP26. Carbon markets and offsetting, they say, do not serve as real solutions. In reality, they're not actually reducing emissions. They're just kind of putting a blanket over what's actually happening. Canada is championing the idea of putting a global price on carbon. It is a big part of our national strategy and one more countries could adopt by the end of the summit. Carbon pricing is one of the most effective and cheapest ways to get there. But not everyone supports it. It's a false solution. Anything carbon-based is false because it commodifies nature and the land. Wanting to hammer that message home, Indigenous groups planned a rally outside of a carbon market discussion Wednesday. However, Greta Thunberg ended up being a part of that session and given all of the security, they decided it was too risky and called it off. She too has been a vocal opponent of carbon pricing, saying it doesn't address root causes or force polluters to change their behaviors. Valerie Cotois is the director of the Canadian Indigenous Leadership Initiative. She says right now, the world needs more collaboration. This movement of Indigenous-led conservation and stewardship is absolutely a response to the threat um, that is coming um, and, and, and looming on us, um, that is climate change and biodiversity loss. People here say if world leaders really want to tackle climate change, they'll focus on keeping the carbon in the ground. Donna? All right, Crystal Gamancing in Glasgow, thanks. Coal is the single biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, followed closely by oil and gas. And though Canada has cut back its reliance on coal, we do still ship millions of tons of thermal coal overseas. Prime Minister Trudeau has committed to ending those exports by the end of this decade. The question is, why can't it happen faster? Here's Eric Sorensen. In 2019, Canada exported 37 million tons of coal, including several tons of thermal coal for electricity. We've committed to end uh, thermal coal exports by 2030. Ottawa's pledge to end those exports is not happening quickly enough, say environmental organizations that descended on the Prime Minister's office this week. They're demanding that exports of thermal coal, among the dirtiest of fossil fuels, should end within two years. It's hypocritical to continue to export coal to be burned in other countries where it has enormous health implications and actually slows the transition in those countries, especially developing countries, away from coal-fired power. Canada exports coal primarily from West Coast ports, much of it for making steel. But the country also sends thermal coal to several Asian nations to power electricity. And on top of that, Canada exports thermal coal from Montana and Wyoming. 
Coastal communities on the U.S. Pacific coast have deemed thermal coal too environmentally harmful. So tons of U.S. coal is diverted through the port of Vancouver, then on to Asia. It's important that any coal ban also uh, ban the transshipment of coal through um, B.C. and other ports. The federal government says it will stop exports of thermal coal from and through Canada by 2030. Environmentalists say by shipping American thermal coal for years to come, Canada will continue to contribute to higher levels of greenhouse gases. The carbon emissions um, that are produced from that level of exports is the equivalent of 8 million cars every year. And those are emissions that are fueling the climate crisis. Canada is moving quickly to end burning coal for power at home. Ontario shut down its coal-fired electrical plants in dramatic fashion years ago. And Alberta, the biggest coal producer, is on pace to end burning coal for power by 2023. Ottawa has also reinstated a federal review of a proposed expansion of the Vista coal mine in Alberta. Critics say as a leader in phasing out thermal coal use at home, Ottawa should show bolder leadership and end thermal coal exports by 2023, not 2030. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. The government of Newfoundland and Labrador confirms the huge disruption to the province's health care system was triggered by a cyber attack. Those involved in the attack may actually be monitoring what we are saying in media and on the floor of the House. It's very important, therefore, we don't do or say anything that compromises the efforts underway to investigate and resolve this matter. It is unclear if any data has been lost. The province's Provincial Emergency Operations Centre has been activated. Thousands of medical appointments and non-emergency procedures have had to be cancelled. A bad night for President Biden. How U.S. state elections delivered a blow to the Democrats. It was a night full of political surprises in the U.S. State elections delivered a devastating blow to Democrats. Voters in key states like New Jersey and Virginia turned away from the party, potentially signaling trouble for the agenda of President Joe Biden. Jackson Prosco explains who won, who lost, and what it means. All righty, Virginia, we won this thing! Republican victory shattered Democrats' decade-long winning streak in Virginia. The GOP took the governor's mansion and the legislature in a state that voted heavily in favor of Joe Biden just one year ago. In New Jersey, what should have been a cakewalk turned into a dogfight. The Democratic governor barely won re-election. There's no easy answer for what went wrong for the party in power. Local issues like education dominated in Virginia. Democrats tried to make the campaign a referendum on Donald Trump. But it may have been the economy and fears about inflation that won the night for Republicans everywhere. This is one of the issues that really flew below the radar in in these elections and is really having a significant impact because people are not trusting the Biden administration and uh, Democratic incumbents to handle it. If Democrats misjudge the mood of the nation, Republicans seized upon it. Both parties are trying to find a winning strategy for the 2022 midterms when control of Congress is up for grabs. The deep political division in the U.S. has actually caused both parties to suffer from the exact same problem. Their biggest names are deeply unpopular. President Joe Biden's approval rating sits at just 42.9 percent. 50 percent have an unfavorable view of him. And if former President Donald Trump decides to mount a comeback, he'll find his numbers are almost identical. 53% of Americans have an unfavorable view of him. We never quit! That leaves state and local races as the barometer of where Americans stand today. Right now, the voting blocs with the power to win elections are swaying away from the party that swept to power last November. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. In Australia, a four-year-old girl is back home with her parents after she vanished from the family's campsite 18 days ago. This is the moment police found her. They say they found the girl after breaking into a locked house at night, and when she was asked who she was, she said, my name is Cleo. They say officers involved in the search wept with relief. A massive land and sea search was mounted in the sparsely populated region on the assumption the girl had wandered from the tent, but evidence began to support an abduction and led police to the house. A 36-year-old man is in custody. 
still ahead, the sensitive conversation around when to raise the Canadian flag. When flags were lowered across the country in May, many Canadians were just beginning to take in what Indigenous leaders had known for years. Children who died at residential schools were buried in unmarked graves, lost and forgotten by the system. There is still much work to be done and many questions to be resolved, including when is the right time to raise the flag again? Abigail Beeman reports. Tim O'Lone is Indigenous. He's a veteran and he says his family was devastated by residential schools. He has unique insights into the complicated question of when to raise the flag. I don't have an answer but my gut is telling me it's, it, it should not be now because, you know, for all we know there could be a school found with 500 children tomorrow. While flags at federal buildings are still at half-mast, on Remembrance Day, the war memorial flag will be at the top of the flagpole, then lowered to honour those who served. Some legions have already hoisted their flags. As for after the ceremony... If they wish to then leave them lowered in remembrance of our First Nations friends after that period, that is up to them. Chief Cadmus DeLorme of the Cowessus First Nation, where 751 unmarked graves were found, supports raising and lowering the flag for veterans as long as it's then raised and lowered again in remembrance of unmarked graves. When we find uh, the need to, you know, figure out, you know, the end goal to raise that flag, that conversation will come when this country truly implements the truth and reconciliation calls to action. The Prime Minister hasn't offered a clear path forward. I am confident that the conversations with uh, Indigenous leadership on making sure we are able uh, to lower the flags once again on uh, November 11th um, will uh, come at the right solution. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole believes it's time to raise them. We have to put the flag back up so it can be brought down. To support both remembrance and reconciliation, I think it's important for the country to do both. O'Toole says he's spoken to many, including Indigenous veterans who support raising it. But the Native Women's Association of Canada says it's more divisive, even if the flag was raised only for Remembrance Day. It's not clear uh, that, you know, you can raise the flag on that day, then lower it without really uh, hurting someone on one side or the other. Difficult choices with Remembrance Day a week away. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Next, what parents need to know about kids and COVID-19 vaccines. We've been talking about COVID-19 vaccines for a long time now. There's a flood of information available about their safety and efficacy. We're not going to go over all of that again, but now that children aged 5 to 11 are being vaccinated in the U.S. and approval is expected soon here in Canada, it is worth talking about children and vaccines. With me is Dr. Isaac Bogosh. He's an epidemiologist and specialist in infectious disease. Dr. Bogosh, the evidence is overwhelming that COVID-19 vaccines are safe and effective in adults and prevent serious illness and death. In the U.S. now, they're going to be used on kids aged 5 to 11. That only happens, though, after rigorous examination of the safety and efficacy. What do we know about that process? There was a clinical trial that enrolled about 4,000 children uh, looking at the, the Pfizer vaccine, which we're talking about here for, for kids. This is a smaller dose of a vaccine. Uh, in that study, it looked like these kids mounted a very reasonable immune response, similar to what adults would mount with the adult dose of the vaccine. And there were no safety signals in this study. Of course, this is a smaller study. You're not going to see these rare, rare, rare side effects like the inflammation of the heart, also known as myocarditis. And of course, that will be looked at as this vaccine is rolled out. It's expected to be a rare, but of course, not zero percent risk. And of course, based on all the scientists that looked over this at the at the CDC and, and all the specialists that looked into this, they felt that the vaccine was a, a very reasonable and safe approach to take and provide significant benefit to the five to 11 year old crowd. And just quickly, what is a safety signal? And then how rigorous is the approval process here in Canada? Yeah, safety signals would be things like adverse events related to the vaccine. I think it's fair to say that, of course, it's not going to be zero. We know that there is inflammation of the heart associated with the vaccine. We also know that the virus itself can cause inflammation of the heart in actually a much greater frequency than the vaccine. 
Uh, and of course, Health Canada will be looking at all the data from the clinical studies, all the manufacturing data, and they'll look at all that. And I think it's fair to say that in the coming weeks, we'll probably see this approved here in Canada. I should I should point out too that you know I think it's it's pretty clear that these vaccines are not only very safe but also very effective in reducing the risk of COVID nineteen, especially reducing severe outcomes from the virus. And we're told kids are going to get a smaller dose. Why is that uh, important? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's fair to say that, uh, you know, kids are not small adults. Uh, the immunology is slightly different. Uh, the adult dose, for example, of the Pfizer vaccine for the 12 and up crowd was 30 micrograms of mRNA, and, and it's a third of that in uh, in children. That's really important. And, of course, in the in the clinical studies that were done, the uh, that smaller dose in the 5 to 11-year-old crowd looked like it was uh, provided a comparable immune response. There's been so much misinformation, disinformation about COVID-19 vaccines in adults. I think we can safely expect the same will happen with the vaccines for kids. What is the best way for parents to avoid going down those rabbit holes? Yeah, obviously you have to be very careful where you get information from. I think there's a few very high quality, incredible sources. You can look to your, your uh, municipal, your provincial and your federal public health web pages. They have excellent information and it's updated in real time. I think the best thing, though, is we know that many parents will have questions about these vaccines and it's hard to predict every possible question that will come up. Uh, I, the best thing to do is to sit down with your pediatrician or your family physician, whoever's looking after you and your children now, and ask questions because you know we have a bit of a gift of time. This is probably still weeks away in Canada and now is a wonderful time to sit down, ask your questions. I, I, and, and really have personalized treatment here so that when vaccines do roll around, we, we know that your questions are addressed. That's great advice. Thank you, Dr. Isaac Bogosh in Toronto. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Ottawa. There are beautiful spots all over this country. Please email yours to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.